The Trinity, Bible Truth, or Human Fiction? Let's start by looking at the evidence of Scripture and see what conclusions we can draw, and then explore church history. It is written in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and 10 and 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Who was the Word that became flesh? Jesus. And Jesus was with God from the beginning, and it was through Jesus that all things were made. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. Wouldn't this mean Jesus himself is God? Jesus did claim to be God. John chapter 8 verse 58. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. And in John chapter 10 verse 30, I and the Father are one. The apostles recognized Jesus as God. Thomas said to him in John chapter 20 verse 28, My Lord and my God. And in 1 John 5 verse 20, We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Jesus taught there was a third member of the Godhead called the Comforter, Counselor, or Spirit. In John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you, and will be in you. And in John chapter 14, verse 26, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And in John 15, verse 26, When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. The Old Testament teaches God is a plurality, not a singularity. Genesis 1.26 Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Even the text quoted by Jews and Muslims that God is one teaches a plurality, not a singularity. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Notice the passage in English uses Lord and God. The reading of this passage with the Hebrew names for Lord and God would go like this. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. What is interesting is that the word Elohim in Hebrew is plural and is the same word used for God in Genesis 1.26. Thus, an accurate English 
reading might go like this. The one is more than one, yet is one. In Hebrew, there are two words for one, yachid and echad. The first indicates singular unity as in one and only. The second indicates compound unity as the oneness of two or more. In this text, Echad is used along with the plural name of God, Elohim, indicating the oneness of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Old Testament also provides texts in which all members of the Godhead are referenced. See Isaiah 48, verses 16 and 17. And now the Sovereign Lord, Father, has sent me, Son, with his Spirit, Holy Spirit. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And in Isaiah 42, verse 1, Here is my Father, servant, Son, whom I, Father, uphold, my Father, chosen one, Son, in whom I, Father, delight. I, Father, will put my Spirit, Holy Spirit, on him, Son, and he, Son, will bring justice to the nations. The Old Testament teaches the close love relationship between them. Zechariah 13, verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. The man who is my friend, New Christian Version, the man who is close to me, New International Version. In Proverbs 8, verse 30, New International Version, Then I was the craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. Proverbs 8, verse 30, I was beside him like an architect. I was his daily source of joy always happy in his presence. And in the New American Standard Bible 95, Then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So it seems the Bible gives strong evidence for the plurality of our one God, supporting the idea that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are a perfect unity of three separate individualities. But... For me, all the above evidence is not what is most compelling. The most compelling evidence for me that God exists in plurality rather than singularity is the nature and character of God himself. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 that God is love. The Bible teaches that this love is not self-seeking. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5 Love is outward-moving, other-centered. Therefore, God being love could not be love in isolation because love requires an object to pour itself upon. Love is other-centred. God's nature and character of love, rightly understood, is the most powerful argument for the plurality of God. And we see this in the Old Testament texts above, as the Father is delighting in the Son and the Son rejoicing in the Father and the Spirit loving them both. Therefore, when God created us in his image, he created them male and female, and the two shall become one, united in a triune relationship, husband, wife, and God, indwelling their hearts via his Spirit. Those who seek to destroy the truth about the plurality of the Godhead seek to destroy the truth about God's character of love, and in doing, place an obstacle to the only healing remedy for sin, God's perfect love that casts out all fear. As we see the truth about God as revealed in Jesus, the lies about him are removed and we are one to trust, and in that trust he pours his love, himself, into our hearts, Romans 5 verse 5, and we are transformed to be like him. Now for a little history. Amongst the founders of the SDA Church, there was great debate regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. 
Some saw Christ as the offspring of God, and, as such, he was not a created being, but was of the same substance as the Father, yet still not equal to the Father, for the Son arose from the Father. This idea goes back millennia, and is sometimes referred to as Arian theology. But Ellen G. White opposed this theology, and came out strongly in favour of the Bible position above. Here are a few of her quotes. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34, Christ the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose. The only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. Isaiah 9, verse 6, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And from Micah 5, verse 2, quoted in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34, His goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. The Jews had never before heard such words from human lips, and a convincing influence attended them. For it seemed that divinity flashed through humanity, as Jesus said, I and my Father are one. The words of Christ were full of deep meaning as he put forth the claim that he and the Father were of one substance, possessing the same attributes. Signs of the Times, November 27, 1893, page 54. Yet the Son of God was the acknowledged Sovereign of Heaven, one in power and authority with the Father. The Great Controversy, page 495. And from First Selected Messages, page 296, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Quoting John 1, verse 4. It is not physical life that is here specified, but immortality, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The Word who was with God, and who was God, had this life. Physical life is something which each individual receives. It is not eternal or immortal, for God, the life-giver, takes it again. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ was unborrowed. No one can take this life from him. I lay it down of myself, John 10, verse 18. He said in him was life, original unborrowed, underived. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. He cannot earn it. It is given him as a free gift, if he will believe in Christ as his personal saviour. And in John chapter 17, verse 3, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This is the open fountain of life, for the world. That was from First Selected Messages 296. And from the Desire of Ages, page 671, in describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is only by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil, and to impress his own character upon his church. And from Evangelism, page 615, 
There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized. And these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. In conclusion, Dr. Jennings writes, So, I do not believe our church changed its position on the Trinity in order to be accepted by other mainstream churches, but affirmed the position found in Scripture and held by some of the church founders, including Ellen G. White. But the beauty of our church is that, while there was disagreement regarding this doctrine among the founders, they did not let this disagreement stop them from working together to spread the gospel to the world. Our church has always respected the individual and recognised the need for each person to come to their own conclusion on all matters of conscience. Why? Because love can only exist in an atmosphere of freedom and we want our church to be filled with the love of God. Therefore, we present the truth in love and leave each person free to decide for themselves. And from November 13, 2009, Trinity, more questions. Thanks for your questions, as your question may reflect the way many think about the Godhead. But I think the idea that Jesus is subservient to the Father is a misunderstanding that, res that results from not appreciating God's character and the way his government works. In God's economy, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Mark 8.35 So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Matthew 20, verse 16 God's kingdom is the kingdom of love, and love gives all for the well-being of others. Thus Jesus is exalted, because Jesus surrendered all and gave all for others. This exaltation is not conferred by the Father to the Son, but a result of the accomplishment of the Son in perfectly revealing and carrying out the Father's character and purpose. A better way to understand it, recognising, of course, that our finite minds are trying to probe the infinite one, so we will inevitably come up short of complete understanding, is that the Godhead voluntarily assumed different roles or functions for the accomplishments of their purposes, a loving way all share together in giving for their creation. Any of these three could have assumed any of the functions. We would err in concluding that when one of the three assumes a function, that he was not capable of functioning in the role of one of the others. As I understand their chosen roles, the Father acts as the source of all that is good. The Son is the medium, mediator, advocate, conduit, agent through which the Father reveals himself or acts. And the Holy Spirit is the actualizer or applier of what the Father and Son have achieved. Thus God was in the Son reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. Jesus' work on earth was the acting out of the Father's heart. His completed mission and victory over sin are applied to the lives of believers by the work of the Holy Spirit. In creation, we have the Father as the source, the Son as the architect, designer and builder, and the Spirit as the actualizer or implementer of their design. So, with this understanding, we realize what Christ meant when he said, I do nothing of myself. Christ takes from the Father to fulfill all the Father's purposes for his universe. In this sense, we can see Christ turning to the Father, not to persuade the Father to be kind, but to receive the fullness of the Father's purpose of love for his creation and carry that purpose out in meaningful action. Regarding the comments from Ellen White, these are her exact words. The King of the Universe summoned the heavenly hosts before him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his Son and show the relationship he sustained to all created beings. 
the Son of God shared the Father's throne, and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. Leaving his place in the immediate presence of the Father, Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. The exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer, who, it was claimed, was also entitled to reverence and honour. There had been no change in the position or authority of Christ. Lucifer's envy and misrepresentation and his claims to equality with Christ had made necessary a statement of the true position of the Son of God. But this had been the same from the beginning. Many of the angels were, however, blinded by Lucifer's deceptions. Pages 37-38 Finally, the Godhead does not operate like a human corporation or military. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom of love is not represented by human nations or corporations which are constantly seeking to promote themselves at the expense of others. God sacrifices himself for others. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 9.